Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Martha Tedeschi, director of the Harvard Art Museums. Truly, I couldn't be more thrilled, or indeed more honored, to be here to speak to you tonight regarding artist Carrie James Marshall. As a fellow Chicagoan, I have long admired Carrie James Marshall's art and considered him one of my artist heroes, and I'm certainly not alone in this. A few years ago, the New York Times art critic Holland Carter wrote of Carrie James Marshall, black skin is constant in Mr. Marshall's art. More than three decades ago, he resolved to devote himself to creating a new disruptive art history, one that would insert big time the absent black figure into the tradition of Western art, which was a tradition he loved and identified with. A new disruptive art history. This phrase gets to the heart of Marshall's mission. He is a master of formal considerations and it is through form that he has cleared a path to what he refers to as reconsidering the question of what art is. In other words, to understand what is recognized as worthy of artistic representation, one must first understand the themes, compositions, and styles that have defined Western artistic production until now. The very tradition that Carrie James Marshall has set about to disrupt. When his first comprehensive three museum survey, Carrie James Marshall Mastery, traveled to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, Marshall said, what you're trying to do is create a certain kind of indispensable presence, where your position in the narrative is not contingent on whether somebody likes you, or somebody knows you, or somebody's a friend, or somebody's being generous to you but you want a presence in the narrative that's not negotiable, that's undeniable. At the Harvard Art Museums, Marshall's work has been at the center of so many important conversations, especially with young people, since we acquired his powerful, untitled portrait of a black artist holding a palette of colorful paints in 2008, the year it was created. The year before, we were fortunate to have acquired his monumental 12-panel woodcut, also untitled, which in its portrayal of six black men in domestic scenes references the art historical tradition of 17th century genre painting. And yet, Marshall complicates the tradition by presenting these men in an unexpected scene, by defying expectations of what a group of six black men might signify in museum goers' minds. Marshall is always interested in what viewers think they should see and showing them something else. Exhibited at Harvard in late 2012, this epic woodcut, which you should see on the screen, um, and Marshall's public conversation about it also made visible the intentional work that museums must do to diversify not only their collections, but also their acquisitions committees and their curatorial ranks, as well as their leadership. Born in Birmingham, Alabama in 1955, and growing up in South Central LA in the early 1960s, Marshall felt the force of immense social change in his own life and surroundings. Those early years created in him a sense of social responsibility, something he carried through his training at the Otis Art Institute, from which he graduated in 1978, and where he received an honorary degree in 1999. When he said in a discussion with curator Susan Dackerman that somebody has to start placing black figures at the very center of what the work is about, he was drawing not only on social considerations, but formal and artistic strategies as well. Western art has followed a particular set of rules that Marshall's work has studied, interrogated, and then systematically broken. Through his artistic sensibilities and the power of his convictions, not to mention his role as a teacher, 
Carrie James Marshall has become one of the most influential artists working today, anywhere. Marshall's work is in the collections of museums across the country, including, and to name only a few, the Art Institute of Chicago, LACMA, the Met, MoMA, the Whitney, the Walker Art Center, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and, as we've seen, the Harvard Art Museums. Carrie James Marshall was named a MacArthur Genius in 1997, and he was appointed by President Barack Obama to his Committee on the Arts and Humanities in 2013. His work continues to pose provocative challenges to what we have been conditioned to look for and look at in art, and thus in life. Marshall makes us see differently. He makes us see what has always been there, and also what has never been there before. For his reshaping of our understanding of art and its importance, and for rending, rendering beautiful what has too often been made invisible, the Hutchins Center recognizes Carrie James Marshall with the W.E.B. Du Bois Medal. Congratulations. That's a lot of iron. <laughs> you know, I, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, there are a lot of ways in which I think I have no business standing here on this stage, at this podium, in this company. I mean, I am surrounded right now by people that I have admired and who have inspired me for decades. And I'm one of those people who, you know, for my life coming up, college was not in the cards for me when I started out. And there's something about being here now I mean, that is a part of a fulfillment of a mission that I had set for myself a long time ago. <laughs> and a part of that was that, well, when there seems to be more than one way to get to Harvard <laughs> than the conventional route that everybody else was supposed to take. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be brutally honest right now and say, I mean, if it wasn't for Skip Gates, uh, I wouldn't be here at this moment. Skip Gates, he, the man is small in stature, <laughs> but he carries a pretty big stick. <laughs> and he's almost impossible to say no to. And he's impossible to say no to because the work that he did outlining in theoretical forms the trajectory and the, and, and the obligations of black intelligence and black intellectuals has been sort of without parallel, without parallel. I remember there was something, there was an article in Art in America magazine with Skip Gates in conversation with with Peter Berger, and he made a comment about what it means to be at the university and what the university stands for. And he said the university stands for the fact that everything that is discussed within the university, that the university's mission is to demonstrate that all those things that are discussed there are not only knowable, but they are teachable, which means that everything that can be known can be learned. And so for me, not on the path to coming to college, to going to college anywhere. I set a mission for myself to find out exactly what it was one had to do. If you weren't going to go the conventional route, how could you still then end up at the top? Yeah. 
And one of the things you discover along the way is that there's no substitute. There's no substitute for knowing. There's no substitute for learning. There's no substitute for exploration. There's no substitute for investigation. There's no substitute for questioning. There's no substitute for challenge. And there's no substitute for the hard work you got to do to get here. So when I was a child, on the first trip I took with my school to the art museum in Los Angeles, to the LA County Art Museum, the experience I had there was so overwhelming, and it was overwhelming in every way that you can say it. Not only was the work that was done by Rembrandt, the work that was done by Van Gogh, the work that was done by Gauguin, the work that was done by all the European artists who are the, who are the touchstones of Western art history, but the work that I encountered there that was done by Africans as well were equally as impressive. And three things left an indelible imprint on my mind when I left that museum. One of them was a figure that was done by the Sanufo tribe of Mali called an executioner figure. It was the most uncanny thing. I had never seen anything like it in my life. I didn't know what it was. I was terrified of it. But it stuck in my mind as a memorable object because the configuration of that figure and the materials that were used to put it together left such an imprint on me that I could never forget it. The other two things that had a powerful effect on me were two paintings by Veronese. They were two allegorical figures, one of navigation and one of mathematics and science. And the reason those things impressed me so much was because they looked like superheroes. And that the scale that those works were operating on showed me that when you come into a place like that museum, you better be coming in there with something. <laughs> you don't come in there halfway. And so when I left that museum, my goal from that point was to say, I, when, when I grow up and I become an artist, I want to have work of mine in this museum, in this museum amongst these other works that I was coming to the museum to admire. Because at a certain point in your life, you have, to, you have to come to terms with the fact that either you will always be out in the world going to places to look at magnificent things that other people do, <laughs> or you can become a participant by trying to match the level of excellence that those people who made those things first achieved. And that the only way you can really, the only way you can fulfill that is to understand fundamentally the terms under which all those things that were already there arrived. You have to know something of the logic that determined that these things were somehow worth seeing more than other things. And then at a certain point you realize that it's not excellence alone that determines whether an object ends up in a museum because a lot of people make excellent things and some of those things never, never find their way in the museum too. But that there are other levels of engagement, other levels of investment in the practice that are worth taking control of as well. And one of them is the way in which people understand the operation of the things that are there. And so when I set the challenge for myself to only paint black figures, it was against the backdrop of an idea in color theory that blackness represented absence, that blackness represented the lack of color, that blackness was to be avoided at all costs in color theory, and that if you wanted the color in a painting that, functioned, that looked like it was black, you had to create that color out of other colors without resorting to things that were fundamentally black. But I set the challenge to myself to try and figure out how to make black chromatic how to treat black paint the same way you would treat blue paint, green paint, or any other color paint. So that if you go to the art supply store and you see, you see an ultramarine blue, a cobalt blue, a phthalo blue, and a cerulean blue, well, that's four different kinds of color, and each one of those colors do different things. Well, the same is true with black, you can discover. So that when I go to the art supply store, I can buy an ivory black, a car carbon black, and an iron oxide black, also known as Mars black. Those three colors may appear in the jar as if they are one single thing, 
that they lack complexity. But if you put those things side by side, then you see that they are all different from each other. And that And that because an object is rendered fundamentally, fundamentally black, it doesn't collapse into simplicity. And so if I've been able to do anything that puts me in a position to be deserving of a medal like this, that is the thing I think I have done. And I appreciate Skip the Hutchins Center, everybody on the committee at Harvard who was responsible for making the selection. I really do thank you and appreciate the recognition, and I am so honored to be here. Thank you. <laughs>